All right, well, we're going to get started. Uh, in preparation for tonight's uh, message, and, and th- I, I'm sure this is going to be the beginning of a few weeks uh, of a, a little look at something, you would think that, that if I was going to be nervous, because I've done this a long time, it would be over new issues or complicated issues. And that is rarely the case. I can't say it's not going to happen, but uh, it, it's rarely the case. When I do get nervous is when I feel like the Lord wants us to look at something that is so fundamental and so basic that the reaction once you announce it might be like, uh, well, duh, <laughs> you know. But, uh, and this is one of those topics, but hidden in the obviousness uh, is, is just a realization that who is Jesus and what has he done is not a question that you'll get a really common answer from when you talk to people about it. Because unfortunately, uh, in my experience as a pastor and as a teacher and as a guy that likes people, <laughs> and loves the church, I find way too often that Jesus is reduced to the role he plays in a person's theology. And uh, that might be a, a, you know, a good theology, it might be a questionable theology, but somehow or another, the person of Jesus himself is minimized in, in our thinking way too often. And so what I think the Lord is hoping for as we go through this for the next few weeks is is for Jesus himself. And remember when we talked about uh, the good news, one of the things that I wanted that definition to expand was that Jesus himself is the good news. Not just what he did and not just what necessarily was done through him. Both are spectacular and fantastic news. But uh, it, I just was thinking and praying about it. If, if we are to articulate the good news in the depth and in the, in the, the power and the purpose that it really represents, I think, Jesus is one point, one biblical truth, one person, one part of the Godhead that we've got we've to think about and think properly about. So uh, anyway... Let's journey into the obvious (laughs) that sometimes isn't so obvious. Who is Jesus and what has he done? And the little subtitle there, if Jesus himself is the good news, it's good if we can answer these two questions with confidence. Um, I won't... Okay, so the mic's going to be up here. There's There's a question period in the middle of this and a question period of... Hey, Sonny. So, we're just going to look at two sections of Scripture. One out of John and one out of Colossians. And I'm just going to like walk us through it, teach it a little bit, I guess, and then I want to hear your thoughts on what these... Well, there are a few other places in Scripture that I really want to look at. I want to look at the book of Revelation some, about who Jesus is, because uh, what a lot of people miss the, miss the title is it's the apocalypse of Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus. It's not the revelation of uh, the, the change in government. It's not the revelation of all those things. Some of that may be in there, but it is specifically a revelation of who Jesus is. And so we're going to look at that. And then uh, uh, there's a couple other references in Hebrews that I want to go back again because it talks specifically about the person of Jesus. So, but here's where we're going to start. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So the first reason I got the title up there is Jesus is the Logos. Logos is a Greek word that uh, has variously been interpreted. Obviously, it's translated word. Um, but it's bigger 
than just generally the concept of, of word. There's another Greek word that talks about a word, it's called rhema, and it has to do with something that is freshly spoken and freshly heard. Uh, I, I've heard people translate this idea of logos as the logic of God. Have anybody ever heard that? Okay, I've heard people translate it as the idea, the, the essence of who God is and what He thinks and what He plans and what He does. And so if you embrace a bigger concept of logo than the Word. Now, uh, I'm not adverse to the translation in the beginning was the Word, but we do live in a, in a theological culture where that gets conflated with this. And it, it's difficult for some people to realize that, that we're not just talking about the Bible. And the way I try to illustrate it is if this were a pillar sitting in heaven, there are folks I know and love that think that sitting on that, probably more impressive than this one, but sitting on that pillar in heaven, there's a Bible. And it pre-existed the incarnation of Jesus. Well, yeah, but it, it, it wouldn't matter because... Uh, it was the forerunner of all press, you know. I, I don't know how to talk about that without at least potentially sounding a little dismissive of that as a thought, but that's not what this is saying. That's not what that's saying. What this is saying is that the Word or the logic of God uh, or if we were to jump ahead to a verse that we're going to have to absolutely look at in, of course, the next two or three weeks, there in Hebrews where it says the exact representation and the outshining of His glory. That, that what this is talking about is that who Jesus is, who the Son is, is the idea, the logic, the heart, the expression of God. In fact, he is God. And look at what it says. In the beginning was the Word. So that places the Logos before anything was created at the beginning. And that's going to be important to keep in mind because we're going to look at another scripture in just a minute. It'll be confusing if you don't think it that way. And the, and the Word or the Logos was with God. The Word is pros. Pros is a proximity word that leans toward face-to-face or at the very least, side by side. So there is a distinction between the Logos and God by the word pros. Okay? And the word was God. Now that is just a straight up declaration that the Logos is God. But the Logos was with God. And this is the, one of the fundamental roots of the doctrine of the triune God. That there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And there's other ways that we need to go on. But So there is a, there is a, a, a oneness. The Word was God. And there is a togetherness. The Word was with God. Does that make sense? Is my, you know, clear as mind, right? He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We're going to look at light in just a second when we go to the next little chunk of Scripture here in First John, or in John 1. But another thing that I find rarely articulated when I talk to Christians in our culture is that this idea that all things came into being through the Word. Almost everybody universally associates the Creator with either God in general or the Father. And I'm not going to be able to explain in a credible way all the nuances of the oneness and the distinction of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, at least not tonight. But... It's a really plain statement here, and it's emphasized twice by the Apostle. 
All things came into being through him. That's the first declarative statement. And if that were the only thing written like this in the Bible, that would be enough. If somebody said, so where did everything come from? How did it? It came through the Logos, right? But he goes on and immediately emphasizes it. And apart from him, nothing, nothing came into being that has come into being. It's just a real double emphasis there that John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is making very plain. Now, what is the significance of that? Uh, Did creation flow out of the heart of the Father? Of course. Did the Spirit hover over uh, the, the waters of chaos? Of course. So God is the creator. But there is a specific agency in the Logos, in the Word, through which creation came. Through which everything came. Look what it says. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That extends it beyond the initial act of creation. And anything that we can see, anything that exists, he is the agent of that and through whom that came. Now, this gets to be more important when we think back to the fact that Jesus himself is the centerpiece of the good news. If you don't realize this, you don't think about this, people often isolate the incarnation of Jesus when he came to an act, and then they have a very small or narrow definition of what he brought, that he took on a human body so he could suffer and die and be the atonement for our sins. But What's lost in that thought, if you don't take this seriously about who Jesus is and what he did, what's lost in that is the reality that Jesus brought his creative ownership of the cosmos into the incarnation. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. By virtue of that statement right there, that reality that John has articulated, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Yes, Ronnie? There's a question slide coming up. But go ahead and ask now. Thank you. The very beginning of this talks about the Word. Uh-huh. The Word was with God. And then it says He. Mm-hmm. So to me, there's something mm. important about it's now... Personified, yeah. Personified. Yeah. And then it said, him. Later. That's very good. In him was life. Yeah, that's right. super important. That's super important. And that is, that is pretty close to the tense of all these things. So that's why the idea of it just being an abstract thing. So the heart and mind of God was personified. That's a really, really important point. Personified in this one called the Logos. This one called the Word. Okay? Um, All right, now let's look a little bit more. As the light, uh, verse 6 says, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. And uh, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He, again, Ronnie, personalized now. So now this, this true light is personalized as well. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, a a reflection of the previous verses, right? The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of... uh, waxing eloquent about, about all of this detail about being children of God. We've talked about it a lot. Um, about who, you know, but what I want to concentrate on it is the question of who is Jesus. So Jesus, in this instance and in the previous verse, is also called the true light. Now if we go to 1 John, 
In chapter 4, twice, and you guys know I make a, a big point of this in my life and ministry, uh, there are four times that the phrase God is is followed by a noun. In John chapter 4, it's God is spirit. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, I think, or 11, 12, 11, 12, uh, God is consuming fire. And in 1 John chapter 1, it's God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And then in 4, it says God is love, God is love twice. So the, the direct declaration in John, 1 John chapter 1 is that God is light. He is light. The Logos is light. The Word is light. So for people to carry the, the, the thought, to try to put all the pieces together, to carry the thought in such a way that Jesus himself is not God, this section of Scripture says he is God and that he is light. And then John later reiterates, and God is light. So there's a, there's a lot here that drives home, if we'll, if we'll let it, our understanding that in and with God from the beginning, the Logos is God, is light. Make sense? Okay. Now, I don't, it's not that easy to understand. I get that. Because we're not accustomed to dealing with multi-dimensional uh, realities in people's lives and recognizing it. But we always deal with that kind of stuff. I mean, as you guys sit here in this room, you are sons and daughters. Some of you are mothers and fathers. Some of you are cousins and friends. So we all have multiple expressions of who we are that are perceivable by other people. And so it's not that weird to think of God being that way. As a matter of fact, the, the, reason, or the, the reason that we can be that way is because He is. It's because He is. And, and the reason that things that we take for granted exist in the form that they exist, like communication, love, are because they exist in the dynamic of the triune God. And so if you push God to a monolithic omni-being, then things like communication become an aftermarket idea. Things like love become an aftermarket idea. But if you realize that the ability to communicate and share ideas, that the ability to communicate and share purpose, and that the ability to have affection in your heart for another person is not some Johnny-come-lately thing that was sewn on the top of or glued on the top of humanity to try to make it tolerable for us to live together. It was literally, before the beginning, a dynamic that flowed back and forth between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Godhead. That's the beauty of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Is because all the stuff that we enjoy has an eternal beginning in there. All the relational stuff. Okay? Make sense? Okay, so he's the light, he's the word, and we'll go on a little bit here. And the word became, or the logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than me. For he existed before me. Now you do know, right, that John the Baptist was born a little bit before Jesus, right? Because Elizabeth was pregnant, and then... Uh, they met, and Jesus was in the womb. John was in the womb. John was born first. But here's what John was speaking prophetically and truthfully said. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Of course he did. He was with God in the beginning. And he was God in the beginning. Okay? 
For of his fullness, we have all received. Of his fullness. Now, this is a huge statement. You've got to understand that the Gospel of John was written relatively late in the, in the development of the New Testament canon. So John had time to reflect on this and had time to be worked on by the Holy Spirit to try to lay these truths out. And he obviously wasn't trying to make the simplest statement he could possibly make. Now maybe he was crafting the simplest statement he could make about such an enormously amazing and wonderful reality of the person of Jesus as the Son, the Logos, and of the Triune Godhead. But John's just laying this stuff out here in a very significant way and faith requires that we honor this and we think it through and we receive these kind of things. So, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Let me stop there for a second. So according to John, it wasn't possible to look at the law and, embr- and see from that the truth. Now, that doesn't mean the law is not true, but it means there's more to the truth than a rule could share. Does that make sense? And so we just have to stand sort of in awe in front of what is being revealed and what is being compared And this isn't a denigration of Moses in any way, shape, or form. Over in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that Moses was uh, over that whole house. Moses was a very honored individual and honored God in a tremendous way through his faith and his faithfulness and his leadership. But there's more. There's more to Jesus. And as a result, when we understand where we fit in this program, which we won't probably get to tonight, There's more to us, too. There's more to us than just rule keepers. There's more to us than just rule followers. Okay? Last statement. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, now there's a weird phrase for you, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. So, the thing I want you to see from that passage is, If we are going to understand God, if we are going to get our questions answered about God, we need to get those answers through the one who can explain Him. Reflect up a little bit. I've already mentioned it. Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 1. It talks about Jesus being the exact representation of God and the outshining of His glory. He is the one who has exegeted him. That's what this word means. He is the one who has explained him. Okay? Make sense? All right. I I feel like I should be more excited about this because I really am excited about this. I mean, I love this stuff. I love this. I've just had to deal with some realizations that we gloss over this stuff and uh, unfortunately... So much of what Jesus has done and so much of who he is gets lost to us when that happens. And so that's kind of why I'm plodding along. All right, let me, I'm going to read, I had one more verse, just, uh, oops, I got to get my glasses, sorry. I didn't include this because I was kind of conscious of time, and I probably still should be, but it seems important that I want to make this point real quick. If we go just past that, Um, in John. He has explained him. Um, where, Where is it? Yeah, so, okay, I just wanted to make it clear. Maybe it is in there. Let me back up and see if I did. Is that right? Yeah, okay, that that was the part I thought I'd missed. Um, For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So what I want to point out by that, the reason I thought I'd skipped over it, is there's no ambiguity about who the Logos is in John's writing. 
it, it traces directly down as the one who created everything, as the one who is God, and one who is with God, as the one who is the light, as the one who the, lo- the word became flesh, and that one that is the Logos who became flesh is Jesus Christ. Make sense? Okay, cool. Sorry, that was obvious. But. Okay, so any thoughts, questions? This whole, uh, this whole chapter, I used to see this, I used to look at this as outside of me mm-hmm. until I realized that I was a part of this all things. Okay, so you're a part of all things that he made. You're also a part of the all that have received uh, life from him. Yeah. The all that have received it. Yeah, this is, this is why it's important to know Jesus. And what he what he did, because we are wrapped up in that. So so then the the um, this this whole the, all this passage is just so cool, because I mean the, the the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. It's that light that's there that doesn't. Man, it's the darkness within me that I can't. I don't understand it, and I don't. Un, it's that. That's, that God is trying to break through. And so this is all personal to me uh, every time I read it to where it used to be, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, mm-hmm. this, is, this is, I'm outside the world and, I'm, and God is trying to uh, bring his light in and so forth. So, yeah, this is totally all personal. And every time I read it now, I'm, I, I, just, uh, I, I just, I really get excited about Bless it. Bless God. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and not only is it personal, it's, it's applicable down to reality. In other words, here where it says, let's see, there was a true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. If you and I are, are, are lured into a theology that creates a category of people who are and aren't, or in or out, or have or don't, we need to submit to this because that's a theological idea that some man came up with. And, it, and it, it's understandable where it came from because uh, we, you know, we manifest all kinds of creepy behavior. We manifest all kinds of individuality apart from God. But behind it all, behind it all, is this truth about Jesus, that he came into the world as the light which enlightens every man. Now, has every man responded to that light? No. Is every man going to respond to that light? I don't know. But I know it, I don't have permission to nullify who he is. Just like you say, Richard, I can't depersonalize any of this stuff with you or with me or with the person that creeps me out. Because I don't have the right to redefine who Jesus is. <laughs> yes, Richard. The other, the other thing that excites me is that this is the jump. This is the springboard for me for evangelism, because mm-hmm. now I can see, wow, it's not just me; it's everybody. That's right. And That's so right. all I'm going to do is speak to that light, try to, try to uh, um, address that darkness, so that they can see what I'm seeing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's cool. And I, I think that that gives us permission to carry an appropriate kind of responsibility for somebody else, I mean, shouldn't I be responsible for what I can now see of Jesus? They don't have to necessarily see it. As a matter of fact, um, Paul talks about our condition being without hope and without God in the world. So that's obviously got to be in that darkness. Um, But he also talks about that he has transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness or out of the domain of darkness, not kingdom, domain of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. Ronnie? So in John 1, 11, which you have up here on the mm-hmm. screen right now, it says he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. And in my prior understanding of things, that was always the Jews. Right. Or the Hebrews or those sons of Abraham. Right. And now I don't see it that way. I see it as all mankind. Me neither. Yeah, or me all neither. Because there, that would have been very easy to make a designation about. You know, he came to the children of Israel or whatever the case is, and they didn't receive him. 
So yeah, I agree with you. I have a question about why was it important that John talk about him being the light right here at the beginning? Mm. What's the context? Interesting. Uh, well, let's see. What do you think? <laughs> I'm asking a question. Uh, uh, I, there's, there has to be some significance that he, you know, I don't know if talk of the day was the difference between the darkness and the light, or people were saying that Jesus was hidden. Yeah, it could be. You know, like there, I, I, there, I'm not trying to, to divert. But uh, I, my, what came to mind was some Old Testament passages. Uh, you know, the one that says, until the morning star rises in your heart, or the sun of righteousness rises with healing in his wings, or Isaiah chapter 60, arise and shine for your light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Behold, darkness on the people, deep darkness on the, uh, or darkness on the land, earth and deep darkness on the people. So maybe there was just this initial thing. And then Following it up, Jesus made a the really bold declaration. He said, I am the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And then as Richard was pointing out, there's virtually nothing that Jesus does that doesn't speak to who we are as well it, with clarity that we cannot see if we're looking outside. And not long after that, he said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe, maybe John was trying to help us understand this isn't just a light that came for Jerusalem. It isn't just a light that came for Israel. It literally is the epoch event, the, 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 the gigantic event of God penetrating the darkness that Adam plunged us into. Yeah, because I think there, it, because he starts at the beginning, in the beginning, God, you know, whatever, and there was darkness in Genesis at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is some. Oh, yeah, yeah, that something. exactly, too. Let there be light. Maybe because it was a reflection of that exact uh, initial reference point that when God spoke creation into existence, that creation had to be called into light. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Elizabeth, yes. No, 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 she, no she, she, she said my thought exactly at the end. I mean, he created the light first, so he is light. That was awesome. Yeah. Now, this is good because, and, and believe me, I don't have all the answers for this thing, but every time I take, and I, I guarantee you, every time any of us take what is being said in these passages seriously about Jesus, our world just opens up more. Not just our world about God, which is super critical, because some people have just the most. I was talking to a, a, a Al earlier, and I've been studying quite a bit from George MacDonald and stuff lately, and he has a quote, and uh, I'll try to quote it correctly. He says, good men many will one day be horrified at what they believed of God. <laughs> and it's because we don't humble ourselves before these revelations, even realizing that they're bigger than we can understand and we don't know all the pieces, how they fit. But just a simple question like yours, Becky, why light? It immediately takes us back to the fact that everything that was made was made through him and by him and for him. Sonny? I don't know, maybe you heard the answer to the question, but okay. I think what, what trips me up about in the beginning was the word maybe other people go there is would immediately try to figure out what form he was because, yeah. you know, he obviously didn't have a human body, flesh and blood. So the word, what, what form? Yeah, yeah. And how? Okay, so I, here's something. This is my thought on that. I don't know. However, God did say, hearkening back to the in the beginning, let us make man in our image. And oddly enough, man came out looking quite a lot like Jesus came out looking. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I, am, I am taking a class with a, a guy named uh, uh, Father Bear, I don't remember his first name, James, I think, who has a teaching, which I have not been able to digest yet, has a teaching that there's, 
there's not really a relevance to the, to the phrase, the pre-incarnate Jesus, because as the Logos, he was all that he ever became. Now, all, all I'll say is that's completely turned my brain to cheese, and I can't explain it, so don't hold it against me. But if I ever do, I'll revisit that question, Sonny, and we'll see what's, what's up. Yes, babe. Um, so in the next slide, I think it is, it's the grace and truth. Yeah. Uh, grace and um, let's see, where is it? Uh, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who was in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Okay, so the only begotten God, who is that? That's, that's Jesus. That's Jesus, okay. We're, we're going to get that in the next set of scriptures. Okay. So, um, okay. What does that mean? Well, I mean, I'm assuming it's because he came through a uterus and was delivered to us um, and was begotten in that sense, you know. Maybe. Of, let, let me, okay. yeah, so, let me okay. go to the next set of scriptures right. and we'll do it. All right, that's good. All right, so the Colossian scripture, I, I went into a little more detail on this one, and I've got about two minutes to go. So this is Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He and we're talking about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. So it reflects very much on what you just said. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth. So you see the reflection back to what John is saying, that by him everything's been made that has been made. Um, the the, the, the kind of monkey wrench in the works, as far as our understanding, is the firstborn of all creation. So let me just keep reading for a second both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So again, this is the preeminence of him through whom everything was made. Hebrews 1, when we get to that, it'll reflect the same thing, that uh, he's the one who created. Now, that word firstborn is an interesting word. It's prototokos, and it, it's a a direct compound word from two parts that are very easy to recognize, proto and tikto. Proto means first in place, time, or order. Tikto means to cause to be born or to cause to come into existence. Now, the priority rank of the Logos, the priority rank of the Son of God among the triune nature of God is a difficult thing to talk about. The, the, the relationship of honor and so on between the Son and the Father, the fact that a Son's identity comes from a Father, these are all concepts we have a hard time talking about in eternity because we always think linearly. And so language has limits that I thought it was really interesting what prototokos is designed to do. Those two words are translated uh, and used in situations where it talks about a firstborn child. But they also literally mean in the f first in the place or time and then to cause to be born. The cause to come into existence. So there was a, a doctrine called uh, uh, Marcionism, I think, where it was, a, it was a thing that was declared a heresy in the early church, uh, and it, it said that Jesus was created, that there was a time before, and it, it ran directly afoul of the in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and was with God, and was God. And so um, in, in the... Uh, early parts of the creed, uh, Nicene Creed and, and Athanasius, he just fought against that and against the Arian version of that. And th the early church hammered out this understanding that there is, uh, there is an out from this that honors the Father. There is a honoring of the Son. You could even see it in, in Corinthians when it speaks of the end of time, where... Uh, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father until all the enemies are made a footstool, until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God, and then Jesus presents that to the Father, and then God is all in all. And so, 
again, I don't fully understand it, but I know that there's a benefit in, in backing away from trying to reduce it down and narrow it down so that it fits my own understanding. And I have some sympathy for the translators of this word. What else are you going to say? But it could legitimately be translated this way. He is the image of the invisible God, the first in time, place, and order that caused all to be born of creation. See it? He is the first in time, in space, and in order that caused to be born all creation. So literally what this is saying in, different, in a different set of words is it is, is it is saying that he is the one through whom everything was made. And he is the, the causative agent of everything happening. Yes, Ronnie? I think that's really cool, but I was struggling before that. And so what I came up in my mind was the movie Back to the Future. It actually okay. works. Yeah. Because God controls time. Mm-hmm. He's not limited by it. Right, right. And he can operate within he it. He can operate within and it. He can even he take wants. a place of first in it without becoming a limit. That's absolutely right. That's right. All right. Well, you guys are pretty smart. That's good. All right. Does that, make, does that help a little bit? And I, I probably need to go back, and I didn't. Matter of fact, would you mind going back uh, in, in John 1? Because you got the thing. And see if it's prototikos. is the same word there for the uh, first begotten, wherever it's used in there. I uh, don't know. No, let's go back real quick and check. Uh, where was it at, babe? Oh, okay, that's the only begotten one. That's a different one. Okay. Okay, yep. All right. Well, we got another little Greek lesson here in just a moment. Uh, on the I last can't one. Let, I can't let Ronnie say what he said and not respond. Okay. <laughs> Are you bringing correction? <laughs> I feel like there's this weird thing about God being completely outside of time that people get really hung up on that doesn't really make sense because he chose to be in time. That's right. He chose to be born. He chose to be affected by growth. Uh, He created the heavens and the earth, the rotation of planets and things, right? And so, of course, he is inside time and affected by it as Jesus in that part of the Trinity. Now, this, this is really right. an important point yeah. because here's one of the big mistakes that happens theologically. No, you stay here if you want. or doesn't matter. Whatever. <laughs> when people make an assertion about God's transcendence and immutability, and they're trying to describe who God is, transcendent means above everything and beyond time. Immutability means he cannot change. They don't realize the damage that is being done by those assertions. Rather than just read this stuff and let it mystify you and work on your heart. And like you say, Richard, go, oh my gosh, I have a role in this. Other people have a role in this. Because if God, if God cannot be acted upon by time, then Jesus is not God. Yes, sir. Oh, no, no, no. Come on. Yeah, we need them for the Zoomers. Now, this is a big problem, and I've never really talked to a whole lot of people who take it as seriously as I think they should. You, when you don't pay attention to these things and let them be a revelation to you, even if it requires humility at first because you don't understand it all, And you just all of a sudden try to squeeze it down and box it in in the smallest possible understanding way. You do violence to who Jesus is. You rip from him the natural glory that is due him as God. Yeah, if you go back to Genesis, there's a technique God does, like when Adam names the animals. Mm Mm-hmm. You can look at that and say, what's he doing? He's naming the animals. But what's God really doing? He's saying, two cows, two horses, two gorillas, two something. And eventually Adam says, 
where's my other half? And then you go through the whole Eve thing. Mm -hmm. I think at the beginning of John 1, he's doing a similar thing. So you've got all that Greek mindset, you know, God is here, we're here. Mm -hmm. God's here, we're... So what's he do? God, God and Jesus. Him. God and Jesus. Him. And he's trying to keep saying him. God and Jesus. Him. Yeah. And, and he's kind of walking you back and forth. And then light. And then truth. And then and there's then truth. light. Yeah. And there's truth. And trying to just keep walking until you go, oh, he is all those things. That yeah. really is who and that, he See, that's is. the conclusion, Dan, that we, we fail to come to. He's all these things. We yeah. don't have to understand that fully. We, right. we, we don't have to build a fence around it and say, oh, yeah, I absolutely got it. Now I know exactly right. who Jesus is. No, we have to let it work on us mm -hmm. because we're the ones coming out of darkness. We're the ones coming out of ignorance. We're the ones coming out of limitations. Yeah. Adam hid. Jesus is pulling us out of that hiding. Mm -hmm. And so it should make sense to us yeah. that this isn't going to be absolutely, utterly the same thing we would talk yeah, about if we just grabbed just... a beer down at the right. thing and, and speculated. Yeah, and I think it's one of those, he just keeps walking you through it, and at some point you're going to start going, huh, it really is? Yeah. He really is that. It yeah. really is God. Absolutely. And so then, you, you, you know, we'll get into this, but the Holy Spirit's job, Jesus says, is when the Spirit of truth comes, he's going to lead you into all truth. And he's going to declare over you everything that the Father has given me. So Jesus is still the centerpiece of our personal understanding of this. And then he adds, because we would not think this way, because we're finite and we're in darkness. Oh, and everything the Father has, he's given me. So that's good. So if you hold up your Bible and then just point to one area of it, yeah, that's what I know about God. Yeah. That little teeny tiny area, like on my phone, just this little area, and everything else I don't know yeah. about God. And so when I run into people that um, will say, well, God doesn't operate, that just helps me to be able to understand it. Say, this is what I know about God. I can't say that I don't, that it doesn't work for me. Right, right, yeah. yeah. I, I use an illustration sometimes. Yeah, really I, I, I use an illustration sometimes on the board uh, or on the screen. So if you envisioned on that screen there being uh, 300 little dots, all separated by varying differences, and, and God is infinite. Right? So those are all true reference points to God. Then I draw the little part like that little circle down at the bottom that I know, and it might embrace half a dozen of those reference points. I need to be careful to not think that what I have been able to understand is all there is to understand. But I also need to be careful and not impose on God schizophrenia so that out there someplace is an evil reference point and down in there is a good reference point. Out there is he is a father, or, or in my, my understanding, he's a father, but out there he's not. This is why Jesus is the one that has to be our interpretive lens, because he's there. Matthew chapter 11 makes an amazing statement. No one knows the Father except the Son, and the one he chooses to reveal him to. That's a really exclusive club. A really exclusive club. But the very next verse opens the boundaries of that club up because Jesus then says, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. All right, I'm going to power through this just real quick and get you to worship, Laurel. So this same word play, Vicki, is part of that. Uh, the idea of beginning here is RK. It's the commencement of a thing. And firstborn is that same word, uh, proto -tikeo. And so then the next word down here is so that he's the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will have come to have 
proteo, first in order of rank. And so when you reflect on, on what I alluded to in that uh, Corinthian passage, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, He's there, He's in our lives, the Holy Spirit is working, revealing, Abba Father, confirming this stuff, as to what Dan said, that's why we need the Holy Spirit to be going, yeah, you're a kid. Yeah, you're a kid of God. You're a child of God. Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father. Because we're not going to draw this from natural inference. It's revelation that comes through the person of Jesus Christ himself. And, and then he's going to be first in order, first in rank, and something amazing is coming together. Yes, Vicki? And this will be our last one. I'll turn over to worship. At the beginning, you were talking about the revelation, that Jesus is the revelation. In Deuteronomy 29, it says that secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. And I was thinking about all of this, you know, as we get these revelations and as we impart them to our children, there's just this building of a bigger God, a bigger trinity a bigger jesus that we have to embrace mm -hmm. and pass on to our children and our children's children and to me it's like the beauty of who trinity is 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 such a deep revelation that as god begins to reveal himself and he can trust us in the revelation that we can really become not just sons and daughters, but we can become heralds, you know, we can become people who speak forth with great authority. We can begin, as you said, Richard, to take it personal, to take it personal. And one of the reasons that, that longtime Christian people who love God, one of, the, one of the reasons that they live repeat cycles of insecurity is because they have not let Jesus be who he is. And therefore, who they are is diminished in that revelation. So that's why we're going to go through this. I just was thinking, you know, I spent a little bit of time, and you guys were good about it, and we talked about it on Tuesday and various other places. Okay, so the gospel is really good news. And Jesus is at the core of it. And the Father's heart is at the beginning of it. And the blah, 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 blah. And then I started thinking, well, what's the point in getting that realization and not going back and taking a fresh look at who the heck is Jesus and what did he do? Because it's bigger than you think. It's bigger than you ever heard in Sunday school for the most part. And it's bigger than you can imagine if you're left only to imagining without the guidance or the way Dan talked about how God revealed that. That was beautiful. Just a little bit at a time. Think of the problem that God had. Just his presence before Adam sent him into a tizzy. And what God wanted was us to be with him. That's why Jesus is who he is and did what he did. And we'll get into it. Bless you guys. That's awesome. Let me uh, fix this here. One last thing I'm going to say before you talk. Sure. This isn't something you can study and come to the conclusion of. Studying is fantastic. The way you get this is the revelation finally. That's what the Holy Spirit is poured out at Pentecost for. So that we can, oh, and then you walk away with stars in your eyes, you know. So praise God.